we can kick this off. So, hello everyone. So excited to have y'all here today for our first user spotlight webinar featuring Raul here from Phantom. Uh, just a quick background on me. I'm Jake Krupski. I'm one of the co-founders of mobile.dev here. And maybe some of the folks in the audience have met with me, usually the one uh, doing a lot of connecting with our users and hearing, just kind of learning about them and, and how they're trying to use Maestro. Uh, and, you know, this is a session that I just, I got a lot of feedback from folks wanting to connect with other users and beyond just our Slack channel, which we're so excited about the huge community that we've built just in a short amount of time of folks using Maestro, um, but trying to find more opportunities for folks to connect live and hear how other people are using the platform. So a uh, quick plug for those who aren't familiar with mobile.dev or Maestro, just the high level we are making, we believe that testing should help teams move faster and, and more safely and not really slow folks down. And, and that was the inspiration to build Maestro. And we've just really simplified the process of creating a, a simple way to write UI tests and run them. So Phantom here is a great representation of a company who's, who's been able to leverage that and achieve a ton of benefits for their uh, team. So that was my inspiration to, um, as I was connecting with Raul some months back, he was telling me a little bit about the impact of Maestro and, and they use Maestro Cloud. And when he shared that they had been seeing multiple regressions in production on a monthly basis, and then said, since adopting Maestro Cloud, they had yet to have one for many months, make it into production. I was like, man, we should dive into this a little bit more to understand how you've achieved that and what, what that means. And so that's what we're here today to talk about Raul's story here, his background, how he came to find Maestro, how he made that call, his experience with other testing frameworks in the past. And, uh, and then getting into sort of how they've scaled out Maestro. Phantom is running, I'm proud to say, tens of thousands of tests on a monthly basis. And, and it's been pretty awesome to see how quickly they've gotten there. So without further ado, let's dive into it, Raul. Um, and I guess one other piece that I'll share is we, we will uh, get into, this is just more of a Q&A session with, with Raul. And then he's actually going to dive into sharing some of the internal docs he created to kind of get the rest of his team on board with Maestro, sharing his best practices with the rest of the org, and then get into a few flows as well. And then at the end, we will make sure we have enough time to get into questions. Free feel free to add your question in the chat here, and, and then at the end, we'll get into some live Q&A. So, there, I will. I think first things first, tell us a bit more about yourself why mobile, mobile engineering for you? How long you've been doing it? Um, uh, where you where do you live in the world? And a bit more <laughs> into uh, what you do at Phantom as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And my name is Raul. I, I've been in mobile since literally the iPhone came out. When the iPhone was announced, I loved it. I transitioned from web, from web development to mobile development because I just wanted to be a part of that. And, my experience has been pretty much just building apps personally, and then I had the App Store mature. There was like a critical mass of, of developers in it. I transitioned into building apps for companies. So I, at the moment, I'm in Canada, but I was living in Ireland before that, and before that in Spain, and before Spain back home in my home country of Venezuela. And yeah, so as, as I mentioned, I think even... Since it's iOS 17, I guess seven, 16 years of, of building mobile apps. And I have tried pretty much a bunch of testing solutions out there. So obviously the internal ones from Esco and Android and Android Studio back then, Eclipse, and then two more multi-platform ones like Cucumber, Gherkin, Appium, and lately Maestro, and obviously a couple of no-code solutions that we used to have before at Phantom. And my role at Phantom is an engineering manager. I lead the engineering of one of our three product teams. My team focuses specifically on asset management, which is why testing is super important for us because this is something very, very dear to customers and ourselves, which is your assets, your money. Um, so appreciate the background on you. Now, journey to Maestro. You shared a little bit about experience with other tools, but curious, um, 
you know, we've had just, I, I appreciate all the folks who shared questions ahead of time, but there's certainly a lot of folks kind of trying to compare contrast other frameworks to Maestro. I'm just curious your experience with some of the others. Um, and then maybe you mentioned you've just been at Phantom for a year. What tools that were there when you came on board? What were the challenges that you were seeing that you wanted to address that they weren't the expectations that weren't being met in terms of tooling? Yeah, so we had a, as I mentioned before, a, a no coding solution. So you pretty much go to a website, you tap things, and then that creates the 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 tech for you. They were great, They're pretty easy to to create. We it aligns pretty much with my philosophy that we need to remove barrier to entry for tests for grading tests and maintaining tests because I don't know if there are any like engineering managers in the in the in the room, but it's definitely hard to have a testing culture at any company. So I, I was I was happy to see that there was already the case for Phantom. I just wanted to make it even easier because that no coding solution require uh, when whenever there were problems with tests, we needed to re re-record them. And then when I re-recorded the test, that broke the test for every single in-flight PR in, in our company, which it was, it was sort of like annoying to just tell people, hey, stop what you're doing, let me fix this test. And then once I have the test fixed, you, you can write your code. So I wanted to stop that. And the best way to do it, in my opinion, was to have the test in the repo itself. And then I didn't want to sacrifice the ease of development. So I could have used some Elapium where you can just have it in the code base directly but that would that would mean that it had to be created by JavaScript. That had to be maintained pretty much by engineering, probably. And I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to maintain the ease of use of our no code while still being able to control tweaking things or just sharing them directly in our in our pull requests. Love that story. And I think this is something after connecting with a ton of folks. It's a similar mindset of this give and take of control. And and Maestro really we we focus to. Um, get, you know, cover both of those bases in terms of ease of use, letting others use it. Um, so, all right. So you, you're looking for something. Tell us a bit about how you discovered Maestro um, and sort of what that experience was. Yeah. So look, looking for Maestro was just, I I knew that there has to be something out there that would, that, that can work a no-code, like a no-code that allowed me to do some tweaks. So I started Googling, literally Maestro was the, the, the first thing that popped up so like kudos on SEO for sure and uh, and I got to working I, this literally this whole endeavor was literally just by myself just trying just trying out the solution while we maintain the other one and I just went to mobile mobile dev downloaded my intro got the app running made some quick tests just to make sure if things were working because our our shop is a uh, magnetic base so our app Thankfully, looks and behaves exactly the same. So I knew one test could work for both of them. Both of them. So I had both simulators running, and then and then running the test on, on each of them just to see how things were going. And I was getting along very fast, very quick, very far. And I decided, okay, let's this this let's give this thing a real shot. So I took all the tests that we had in the no code solution and made them in Maestro. That took me like a day at most. And then I wanted to run them side by side with the other ones. So I needed to hook them to CI. That's when I first thought, okay, this is going to be hard because now I need to run this test myself in GitHub action, which is going to be complicated. I had done this before and this is time consuming for sure. Yeah. And then I noticed there was my extra cloud. I looked up the GitHub action and then just literally plug it into our system. Thankfully we use Expo Go. So by using Expo, we also use the Expo build, build service. So what I needed was just download the artifacts from, from Expo server and then just send them to Maestro Cloud for, for running for running the test. And I got that set up running in a couple of days max and then just let it soak. Both tests running side by side for a couple of weeks. Once I got the confidence that Maestro wasn't just dropping tests or, or flaky or anything, I turned off the other one and then we... We have been running Maestro since since then. Love to hear it. Yeah, I I, rem I was reflecting. It was funny when we first connected. I think it was back in February or something. I remember we met and you had just discovered Maestro. We sort of connected real quick on a few questions you had. And then it was like within a few days, you were running, I don't know, tens of flows already on Maestro Cloud pretty consistently and had everything hooked up. 
um, which is, is really what we're going for. Cur you know, a few, a few questions that I feel like I've, I saw a lot of folks and, and we see people contemplate. First one I think is what was, I think the first question I'll go into is sort of like testing strategy. Uh, a lot of folks look at an approach of, you know, let's have a, f a suite of tests that we run pre-release, you know, a, a bunch of flows that they either are running manually or whatever it may be. But you, I know at Phantom, you kind of have a different approach of the test early and often and tell us some of the, that motivation as well of the, uh, the high level strategy that you had at the org at Phantom and, and sort of how you envision Maestro accomplishing that for y'all. Yeah, this is a philosophy shared by the whole engineering company. Like we literally from our CTO down, we just want to test things as, uh, and as early as possible. And then the best way to do that was to run every single end-to-end -end test on every pull request. So whenever I make a change, whenever I make a change to a change, I'm coming and setting and sending further commits to my pull request. I'm, I'm building the app from scratch. I'm running all the tests because I want to make sure that we're not introducing anything. Of course, we're not running the, the, the full suite because that will just increase our time or delivery. But we do run a lot. So we identify what are our most important mission critical sections of the app. We make tests for those and then we run them constantly. And then we also have the manual list of regression suite that our, our QA our QA teams run. We will run those on, on every release. But we also automate that. It's just a give of action. Builds the app, sends that those new flows to Maestro and the Maestro Cloud run them. Then we get the results. And then we do the manual testing for the other areas that we haven't automated yet. Some tests will never be automated, like connecting with hardware, or we have external things that we we can connect to our wallet. We cannot automate those, so those still need some actual human testing them. Awesome. What was there? Do you have a sense, sort of, of like how much work you were doing manually previously to what you are now, or does it does it feel the team is able to move faster uh, like on releases and things like that? Do you have like, yeah, some sense. I, my, my biggest goal was to just increase confidence. I wanted to just put up a pull request. And then once I see that a pull request is green, that allow a peace of mind that I can merge this. There's no unforeseen side effects happening, which is obviously probably impossible to do, but we have definitely caught many situations where I think I'm changing something very innocent, but that's actually breaking something important down, down the line. So our core flows test have cut out these things and obviously our QA team also cuts everything that automation or developers is. Got it. Yeah. That, um, I think it's a common story we hear from a lot of the users we connect with there too, but it is, it, it kind of just highlights the importance of like how quickly something could break. Um, at, at, even if you're making just a small change in the power there. Um, I think another another question that comes up a lot as you're thinking about like scaling out your testing is there's a there's a lot of folks who have their own infrastructure today that they are are running on or you know kind of running maestro themselves and curious how you thought about how how you weighed that um, as you're making that choice for Phantom of you know relying on a third party or running on your own infrastructure and some of your experiences there. Yeah, we, we definitely wanted to be in the business of creating wallets and Web3 experiences and not maintaining the build process. You will find that it's normal for, for companies to have just a team that they're dedicated to, to build infra infrastructure. Even in things like native where pretty much the building process is the same for both apps, but that still requires manual tweaking and then updating your your CI, updating your images, making sure that the React Native version is up to date. We wanted to move away from that and then that's why we chose Expo. Expo builds all of that all of that for us and then we wanted to maintain the same mentality for our testing infrastructure. We just didn't want to test ourselves because I will have the same problems. We will have to have Mac OS images for iOS. We'll have to have either Windows or like Linux for Android and then we just need to run them. We need to run them headless and then that can fail, that can, and then I didn't want to have more problems to testing. As, I re as you remember, I mentioned not, not having barriers. So that will, that will be a big barrier. And then that would also remove confidence because if it breaks, people start believing that the system, that infrastructure is flaky. So they stop 
looking at the results or I wanted to I wanted to install when a test breaks or fails is because something really got broken and not because something is flaky, the infrastructure is flaky or the tests itself are flaky. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is something too that, and maybe we can, as you get into it a bit too, going through some of your flows, I think some folks are always curious of, of combating flakiness and some of the things, some of your best practices, I know you have laid out that you can get into later, but I know that's a big thing of, you know, how you write your flows and combat there. But I think just for on this topic of scaling Maestro and we can just get in the last pieces of the impact you've seen. Zero, zero regressions. Tell us a bit about the like, world that you came into and now what, what that process is and how you've achieved this um, zero regression world for Phantom so far. Yeah, so obviously this is also hand to hand with our with our basic QA system with QA team, but uh, Biaso has allowed us to catch things in development, which is obviously a great uh, thing to have because now you know that the breaking change is only encapsulated to that particular for that particular PR. So something that we that we did to keep that is to just to have individual tests. They are single purpose. They only do one thing. And then that way I can identify breaking situations or any specific examples. As I mentioned before, we our team here handles uh, with set management. So one thing that we did, and I can make them maybe the web two example is, let's say you have a bank account with multiple currencies and the test to only send USD dollars wasn't enough. I wanted a test that would send multiple currencies and it just, I'm recreating the same test over and over, but I'm trying to catch as many exam, as many problems as possible. And in our case, I had to even do it multiple times because we, I cannot send it through multiple networks as well. So I wanted to catch multiple currencies on multiple networks. And then that means that I'm creating the same test over and over, but is testing actually different code paths, you know, code base and different integrations, which is what I wanted at the end. And then that, that catch many things because I don't need to test all of that. If I had to manually test that, it would be at the moment of the, we're talking right now, we have three networks, but the idea is to obviously keep growing. So imagine a situation where I have to like send something eight times when, I, when I'm developing and then every time I make a change that, that would be soul crushing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would not want to do that work myself. Um, and I, that, that is the power of automation. It's awesome to be able to uh, eliminate that kind of mundane work. Well, I think, you know, this story is so awesome. I think a, a thing that people are probably eager to get into is a little bit of just like, if you could share a little bit more of, you know, especially now that you've deployed this, what is, how have you set up Maestro internally? And maybe you can pull up the doc of sort of how you communicated this back to the org, but you know, who's writing flows now and how are you iterating and what are some of the best practices you've put in place that, that have allowed your team to move quickly? Um, and then I think, you know, diving into some, you know, flows you've created and just some of the perspective there as well of, of, of how easy that was and, and how you're maintaining those. Yeah, initially it was written by, by myself. We did maybe four or six for the whole company and then everyone else is started implementing their own. At the moment, they're written by engineering and QA, but the, the goal is for anyone to do it. And in order to just do that handoff, okay, I'm done researching this tool. This tool is great. We're going to use it. So I we created this little document that I'm going to share with you right now, which is pretty much just what there are best exam or best practices and things that, that that we have done with with maestro and then obviously one of them is introduction what is what is maestro why why are we doing this how to install it i obviously link to the actual doc documentation because there's no need for me to write that thing and then this is pretty much what i go into how is our file structure and this is the thing that pre probably got me the furthest is i just needed to create two subflows that would do that will be pretty much the entry point of every other test. A test will either need to start with an existing user or a brand new user. So I I, create, I divided our test into a utility folder where all these reusable flows go to. And that's pretty much how every test starts. I go with, okay, this test is gonna be about a, a new user. So I add that flow in there. 
And then I pretty much just keep it as simple as possible with like a list of commands. I didn't want to overthink it. I didn't want to create pages. I, I, I didn't want to have a DSL on top of Maestro because yeah, YAML files by definition are already pretty simple. I didn't want to, as I mentioned before, have more barriers to entry. And then installing the app, this is something that initially I was fighting against because I thought, okay, it would be much simpler if I just the test, if I run the test on my development client. But the problem with that is that Expo adds a, a bunch of unnecessary UI and unnecessary things into it. And I wanted to test what users saw. So I actually just am running the test exclusively on Nightly Builds. With the Nightly Builds, are pretty much exactly what our, our users are seeing. And then I created this GitHub, the GitHub action that just takes the the... The, the build from Expo Expo build server and then just appends them to the to the CI in case you wanted to run the test yourself locally you just download your already build app and then just go to town on tests and then writing tests of course this is like the most important part for, for this thing is that we separate them into smoke and regression the smoke tests are all the ones that run on every single PR and every single commit change, and the regressions are the one that we manually run on on releases. By manually, I mean just clicking on a GitHub action button. There's nothing actually manual about running this master test. And then this is the definition of what to do. They run manually by QA every time. And, but obviously, since it's a GitHub action, you can just run them every time. And sometimes I do that when I feel my change is just too too large, I go into the GitHub action, select my branch, and then say, okay, you just run the whole suite. And then when I run this, it's running both the smoke and regression at the same time. Just some back practices about how to do things. Maestro and pretty much every, every other internal solution for testing, they rely on sensibility. So it is important that if the screen reader can see your app, that is pretty much how Maestro sees it. And then that allows me to just use the accessibility inspector in iOS to just check that, to see that all these things are actually labeled correctly. And that is something that we wanted to maintain because this gives us the double value of, okay, we're making our app better by having testing, but we're also making the app more accessible because we're changing things to be available for Maestro Studio. And then that enables accessibility for users that actually need to use screen readers. But as you may have noticed, and now in Maestro Studio also has something similar. So what I was doing is I was using Accessibility Inspector for iOS, and I was using Maestro Studio for Android, just, just to make sure that, that I was building tests as, as the same way, because sadly, Android and iOS implement accessibility difference. So some elements have different text on it. And then that's when I may have to make the decision of, of my other change sensibility myself to be the same, or I just tweak with uh, regular expressions or just the actual conditions from. So, but that's something that, that I try to avoid. So the best practices for our team are that they should be repeatable, meaning that running again and again should yield the, the same result. This is super important for us. If I, for example, ending flow, I have maybe a hundred thousand of fake coin in it, and then I just send one on every test. That means that I can send that a hundred thousand times, and then, and then I can just refill it again with fake currency when I do. And then keep your tests short and split them into multiple tests if necessary. Like initially, when when you hear that you you run them by a flow, you probably have the strong urge to just put everything into a massive file, but that just that just makes it very slow and then for probably unnecessary. Is much better to have the parallel support for Maestro, Maestro and just run and test in parallel than just run, run one massive one serially. And also, I want to keep it simple, avoid using conditionals as possible. Sometimes there's no way around it. I have to do a condition for iOS and Android, but I try to keep those to a minimum. And then don't use real wallets, of course. All of these are done via testnet and they use fake currency. We don't want to expose anything in our tests. And then organize tests into plans, identify when we need to test them. And then this is the, the situation where we run them in a smoke and, and our regressions. And then the probably the part that I'm more, more dictatorship about it, every time I see a test ID, I want to change it, is because accessibility should take priority over test ID. Most people will want to just put a test ID, a test ID, and then just get over with. But I want to hit on that text 
on that next button. I want to switch that pin, that allowing switch. I want them to read as human as possible the test. And yeah, and then every time someone has a problem with my S or as a question for me internally, I just frequently ask questions to this document and then this will just grow and grow. Obviously, this is a simplified version of the document, as you may see by the private sign at the top, but you know, that's pretty much what this is the gist of the document. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, and hopefully some good context for the team. I'm curious to now you share this with your team and, and who is it you, and you have your smoke, say your smoke tests and then your regression tests. Curious what that breakdown, like how many regression tests are you running versus the, the, the smoke ones that you're running much more often. And then the other question that I wanted to, I think, and folks are maybe wondering is like, who, who's now writing these tests internally? Cause I know you wrote a lot of them at the beginning, but what does that you know, is it QA folks or mobile engineers within the team? Yeah. So for the smoke test, we normally have engineering, engineer write them. So for my team, everything that has to be related to asset management, we write those. And for example, our ecosystem team, everything that has to do with our internal explorer, they will, they will write them. But, and then the regression ones have been written by QA, which is something that I'm pretty proud of because. Some of my of folks weren't technical savvy. So the fact that they are able to write these tests themselves, with zero guidance, they have been trying to like pump them out as quickly as possible. It's been very nice to see. At the moment, I think we have over 25 regression tests running and over 15 of the smoke ones. But obviously that means twice as much because they run on each platform each. So yeah. we're running 30 to 40 tests end-to-end -end tests on every commit, and then maybe a hundred tests on, on every regression. And obviously we want to go more. We want to, we have a list of run books of everything that we do manually. We have fully automated that, but that's definitely our goal. And that will, that will land us into maybe hundreds or maybe a thousand, a thousand tests per, per release. That's awesome to hear. I'm curious too, just like, especially the non-technical folks, how long did it take to get them ramped up? On, on using Maestro? Like very little. The, the biggest problem was that they needed to have some sort of a script or something that either builds the app for them or downloads the app for them in, in from Expo because running and creating the test is really easy for them. They just needed to have an access to the, to the app. That's why I created that little give of action that gives you the two links. And yeah. I told them whenever you want to test something, just go to any random PR at the company and just steal that that bill from them. That bill will be pretty much up to date and then just use that for your test. And it's awesome to hear. I feel we're seeing more and more teams getting folks ramped up pretty quickly that you know don't come from a developer background, which is a big motivation for a lot of orgs adopting it. Um, well, this is awesome. I think the, the last piece, I know you had a few flows as well. If it makes sense to walk through those, we can to just give folks a sense of how, how your, your mindset for writing flows and, and especially if there's some folks who are a little bit newer to Maestro, just how quick and easy that was. Yeah, I, I can share one of them here. Obviously there are very, very simple and uh, share any of our, of our sensitive yeah. tests for sure. No, I appreciate you picking out some of the ones that are safe to share because we get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but this one, for example, it starts with that, with that utility that I mentioned. We just need to onboard someone new. And then what we want to do in this particular case is that we just want to test that our, our blog list is working. So whenever someone to, uh, someone goes accidentally or, may, or maybe by, by intentionally by, by, by a malicious agent, they try to go to a to a scam website. We try to stop them. And then the way we did that is literally just using that utility to onboard a new user. And once that happens, you created these seven steps of how, what to test. Just go to the Explore tab, click on the, on the search bar, then input the, the fake website of Phantom, and then press Enter. And then just assert that this actually is something malicious. And then you can see here the app is showing that this is a fake website. Don't, don't go in there. And I tap close. That's pretty. That's pretty much it. I don't overcomplicate myself in these things. I'm not asserting that 
account one is pressing the nav bar, the, the close button is present, I just try to tap that button. If that button is not there, that the maestro would will give me a screenshot of this and then it will show me that something is wrong. So this not only makes your test faster to run, but also it just reads nicer than just having a serviceable A1, a serviceable phantom web, a serviceable close. Just as I mentioned before, I'm trying to make them as human readable as possible and as easy and maintain as possible because I don't really care if this X, if this close button moves from the top or to the bottom. I just want that. I just care about the functionality that someone can close the explore tab. And then that's pretty much what I, what I want to test. And then obviously I have another one, not, not that exciting either, but this is a case where I really wanted to overcomplicate myself. I went, okay, maybe I should be testing our how many languages we support. And again, I just go by use the reusing the same onboarding tool, onboarding user. But I took advantage here of GitHub Copilot and, and Maestro, where if you see at the bottom that I just have a long list of assertions. And then the way I was doing it, GitHub, GitHub, GitHub Copilot was giving me the suggestion for every single language. So I had a comment at the top of all the languages that I supported and the GitHub pilot was just, every time I press enter, it would say, scroll down until X is visible. And I would just hit, yeah, that's perfect. And then, and then enter, tap, and then I just, I could have made a fancy script here that just loops through a list of arrays, but I went, this is not necessary because I I this would be pretty easy to, to, to maintain if, I add a language or if I remove a language or if I change the order of a language, I can just change it with the two lines of change instead of me trying to create a whole system for this. Yeah. And by creating systems and creating DSLs on top of your tests, I find that I, I may be creating bugs on my tests and then how am I going to test the tests? Yeah. That's a pretty cool, I mean, even though it's simple and the way you see it. but I mean, imagine doing that man, going through that manually each time or just making sure all those are showing up and those, yeah, you know, it's, it's just those simple things that just save you time and, and it's, it's powerful to see it live like that. Um, yeah, that was the, the pitch for getting QA to write them. I'll say, what is the most tedious test you do? And then let's try to automate them. And then we did a couple of them and then they, they really liked the idea of just like never doing that again. Well, awesome. I appreciate you talking through that, that whole journey and, and, and sharing some of those internal pieces that you've built for Phantom. Let's see, uh, let's get into some questions now. I'll, I'll start with some of the That's ones good. that we've seen. And actually, I, let me, I'll pull in Leland here as well, in case we have some, some technical questions that, that he can better answer. Just got to find him real quick again in our list of attend. Here we go. Awesome. Hey, folks. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know him, Leland is a uh, co-founder and our CEO here at mobile.dev and author, co-author, I guess, of Maestro itself. So um want to make sure we had him here too for some of these uh, questions that we're getting. All right, Amir, appreciate you with all the questions here. Um, let's start from the top, but maybe this got answered. And Amir, what, based on some of these, maybe I can open up. Uh, we, we can get the dialogue going as well. Uh, first question were some of the limitations of Maestro. For example, if a customer environment variable needs to be passed into a test, how can this be done? This might be more in the Leland realm. Sorry, can you repeat that one more time, Jake? Yeah. What are the limitations of Maestro? Uh, for example, if a custom envir environment variable needs to be passed into a test, how can that be done? Yeah, so Maestro does have support for environment variables, whether you're running locally or running on the cloud or running via GitHub action. Um, there is a first class way to inject environment variables into your script. So you can just search for, I believe, environment variable in the documentation and that, and that should show up there. Uh, another question from Amara is, if I need to enumerate through a list of items on a screen and do some kind of calculation, how can I do this with Maestro? So Maestro does have JavaScript functionality. Uh, there may be something creative you can do with uh, the JavaScript fun function there to be able to do, but I think we'd have to dig into exactly what you're trying to accomplish there to understand the best way to accomplish this with Maestro. Uh, one feature request that isn't possible uh, today 
that I've heard recently is the ability to use the repeat command in Maestro and be able to access the actual index um, at each inter iteration of that repeat loop. And that potentially could help with this sort of situation. But again, I think we'd have to dive in specifically with that scenario and see what, what's actually possible to accomplish what you're, what you're after. My takeaway, I'm going to follow up with you and, and we can get into some more specifics on questions you have here, but I appreciate you raising these up. Um, all right, just moving down my list here. Um, some love for Pearl Jam at the beginning and some suggestions of other music. I love it. Okay. Here's from Grant. Uh, have you implemented any tests that involve capturing media with the camera or uploading media from a device? Um, if so, what challenges did you run into along the way? And so I guess Raul, if, is that something that you've tried out yet? Uh, not yet. Our, our, all our tests run on simulators and emulators, so we don't have access to the to the to all of the hardware there, specifically the camera. We do have tests that deep link into certain areas of our, of our app, and then some of the, some of those areas are actually QA reading. So what we do is instead of opening the camera and try to read the QA, I just directly deep link the same way the camera will deep link into our app. And then that's how I'm testing those particular scenarios. But if you plan to run a device farm and then actually have real devices, then technically you could do it, but I imagine that would be a lot of setup because you will have to have the device there and then have the thing in front of that viewpoint of the device. So I would suggest maybe something alternative. Yeah, I'm curious, Leland, I know this is something that we're kind of in the works on, correct? Yeah, in terms of actually interacting with media, we are working on a specific Maestro command that allows you to upload and add images or video files from your workspace onto the device that you're testing. And that would be an actual first class Maestro command. So that is something that we are, we are working on. Uh, in terms of interacting with the camera, yeah, I think everything echoing what Raul was saying, this might, might even be more difficult with real devices, given that you'd have to have something physically in front of those devices to take a picture of or video. Um, so yeah, you know, I think uh, using the camera would require some workarounds here, but preloading the device with images or videos, um, that is something that should be available soon. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We've got questions just piling up, so uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. Um, uh, Raul, here's a question to you of, of how are you maintaining your script stability, uh, especially since you're running it um, in every execution or on, on every PR? Yeah, I we rely obviously heavily on the fact that Maestro Cloud hasn't go down on on running the test, but for the actual test execution, what we do is in that initial best practice is that the test should be something that doesn't leave the app in a in a dirty state. And I also I I I didn't show it, but every single onboard new user or onboard existing user utility launches the app from scratch and that's why that's why you saw that every single test actually goes into a login process because we wanted to avoid that that one test fails and then everything else is set up in a dirty state so i wanted to have run from scratch every single time obviously it makes the test slower because i have to i'm probably tested the onboarding phase a million times by now but it gives me the the, the assurance that i'm testing everything in a safe, empty environment, which is what I, what I want. No, that's great. Um, great perspective there. Let me move on to the next one. This is from Amur again. If there is a certain, is there a certain flow that is behind onboarding, for example, do you include your onboard test in your, let's say, profile flow in order to pass onboarding and to get to profile flow? Yeah, so what our... Pretty much our utility folder is just a set of, of flows that get the, gets the user from point A to point B. The two obvious ones is just onboarding user, onboarding system user, but we also have one that says go to asset Solana in the Solana network. And then, and then some other one that says prepare asset from Ethereum to Ethereum. And then what that does, it just starts clicking on a series of events and then leads me again in, in a place where I can start doing my tests. 
And then at the end of the day, it turns, it just turns into a Lego building block where I go, okay, onboard, onboard existing user, prepare Ethereum uh, asset and then send Ethereum asset. And then the last items are just validating that it actually got sent and validating that it that it got sent the same amount. And then I do this with subflows and environment variables pretty much. Like, so I can tweak it. It's the same set. Prepare Ethereum, for example, is just literally prepare asset where the environment variable is network and then and the other one is asset names. And, and that way my store knows that I need to switch to the Ethereum network and then that I need to click on this specific asset. Those are the ones that I sadly cannot show, of course, because <laughs> the environment variable of onboarding existing users requires me to use real username and passwords. No, understand. Appreciate you walking through that. Um, and hopefully Kyle, that gets you, or I mean, or that gets you a good answer and perspective there. Um, I see we have a raised hand and I'm trying to think we have a lot of questions here. What's my best approach? Um, if you want to, let me see if I can oh, speak. In the meantime, well, I figure that piece out. Next question was, and, and Leland, this is probably one, I actually know this, but does Maestro support OTP login? User enter their phone number, receive a text message with OTP. Yeah, this is this is one that is a common question for any testing framework, actually, is yeah, how how would you automate that interaction where you log in and there's a two-factor auth sends you a one-time password to SMS or email. How would you actually retrieve that that pin and enter it into your automated flow? Usually we see um, a couple options here. One is creating an, a test account to use for your automated flows that bypasses the two-factor auth. Um, the other one is exposing a backend endpoint that allows you to retrieve that token via an HTTP call, um, which is supported in Maestro. So using the JavaScript functionality, you can make requests to your backend, uh, to your API, to do things, set up a test fixture, or te set up a test account and before your, every test that you run, you know, retrieve that, that OTP token um, or pin from your backend. Um, so you can do all these things. It does require setting up some of those, uh, that functionality, that test functionality uh, on the backend side of things. But this is typically a couple of the options that we see when people are trying to work around this. Thanks, Leland. All right. I am opening up for your question, Martin J. Hey, hi, guys. So uh, I'm a React Native developer. Uh, I have been using Maestro and I'm actually a fan of Maestro. It uh, made it very simpler. So I have two quick questions. Uh, first is, uh, so there is uh, one a particular command that is retry trap if no changes, right? So for some reason, I just keep on seeing that it just, try, it just tries to retap time and again where I don't want it to and it just breaks the flow. So I have to always include that thing. Retry if no tap uh, if no no changes or something. I just forgot that command. It is a retry a tap if no change. So I have to include it in every single uh, tap. Else it will tap twice. So I don't know if this is like coming from our end or uh, it's something to do with Maestro. Second quick question is uh, how do I put delays? There are times where I actually want to have a delay. So one way is if there is animation involved. I, I can add delay that uh, wait for animation to end, but there are times that when I'll actually want to have a delay on my own. So can you just put some light on those questions? I, I can super, uh, super quickly address the bun. You try yeah. tap on change and having to disable that for a lot of different commands. We have heard this before, uh, you know, this was added in, I, I'm sure you can guess as, as an attempt to combat uh, any sort of flakiness. So. You know, as a same way that a user would try to tap on something, and if it didn't work the first time, kind of tapping again. Um, what we are finding is is similar to what you're uh, mentioning here is that sometimes this results in um, unintended taps breaking the flow. Yes. Uh, the challenge here is, you know, if we were to set the default to false, there it would change the behavior of Maestro and and likely break other flows. So we just kind of have to uh, think through what that. Uh, migration path looks, but definitely I'm hearing you on that front. Uh, in terms of the delays, uh, we have a couple options, but maybe 
uh, Raul, to bring you into the loop here. What has your experience been with needing or not needing to add in kind of artificial delays into your flows? Um, how how you've been thinking about that? Because that is a definitely a valid question. Yeah, we we started seeing that when I initially I wanted to use the same test wallets that we use in development, but that those two wallets are obviously growing and growing, and then they make retrieving assets and then just overall moving around the app is lower. That's why I isolated testing users for for my so which I have just a handful of assets that are pretty fast to load, and then that way we keep those uh, we keep those fast. In the rare cases when we actually have timeouts flakiness, we just literally do use the weight extended for from my answer and then just apply those there. At the moment, we only needed to do that in two places when we actually make a transaction because we're going to the blockchain. We're actually waiting real time in there. So we we wait maybe 20 seconds and for the initial inboarding because we don't know how many accounts someone has. So we have maybe a 30 second delay there. The good thing about my story is that it won't wait for the actual 30 seconds when it sees the thing I'm trying to see, we just continue. Awesome. Thanks, Raul. Brent and Jay, I hope this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that does. That does. Uh, uh, okay, you guys, just one last thing. So I'm kind of new to Maestro. So what is the best way to reach out to you guys? I mean, uh, mailing and all those things. Please help us with that as well. Absolutely. Because the school is very awesome, but sometimes we'll just need some help. <laughs> yeah. You can go Slack is the best place. Uh, joining our Slack community. And then you can, of course, you can always direct message us as well. If there's specific things to your company you want to ask about, but there's over, you know, a couple thousand folks in our community. Pretty act we're very active there and make sure that when we get to all to all the questions and comments that come up. So definitely encourage you to go to our Slack community. Um, you can sure. also just email me at jake at mobile.dev and, you know, we can set up time and chat more about specifics there. Yeah, yeah, sure. We are planning to move to uh, Maestro Cloud like, Maestro Cloud for uh, CI and all those things. So, yeah, definitely I'll uh, reach out to you. Thank awesome. you so much for clarifying all the doubts. Thank you, guys. Of course. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, we don't have much time left. So I'm going to cherry pick a few here questions that are more um, geared towards Raul. And then I think what we can do is get to, I'll make sure I save all these questions and, and follow up directly with folks to get y'all answers as well, just because we are short on time. Um, I see some questions about network marketing. We don't do that. We actually use the real, the real servers, but the way I have done that before is that there's nothing really stopping us from creating variables for exclusively for our tests. We, at, at Phantom, every company that I have been, we always have a uh, property in the app that says is UI testing. And uh, in situations before we have, we switch our, pro our production endpoint to actually something that is marked. And that helps us with every other test because that way I control the, the server response. And for example, that person that wanted to sum less in an I in, in a list and then check the, the end result that can only be done if you are mocking the screen to be exactly the same all the time. Otherwise, the end-to-end -end testing will fail because something will change in the in the in the app. The date will be different, the currency value will fluctuate from day to another. So if you want to do those things, I would recommend just mocking entirely the the, the back end and just return fix. JSON payloads to the to to your app. Mocking at is definitely another frequently asked question for folks on best practices there. Uh, okay, let me see. I see um, Santiago. Why don't using test IDs and comments to let the user run the test, knowing the context? Mostly accessibility. I want the app to be accessible. This is super important to us, of course, and then that's. Sometimes there is no, no getting away with it. And sometimes I just want to click that little switch in something and then making that accessible is, is, is very difficult or time consuming. And then, and then I, I allow for the test ID there, but I, I do have comments in there that says, okay, this is, this is that switch at the bottom. It should, it should be clicking this area, but I try to get away with it because I want accessibility and I want just 
how easy it is to parse and read those tests. Love it. Love the approach. Um, shout out from Simon, pretty much. Simon Gilmurray said, the, the way that you structured the scrolling language test is super interesting approach. I would normally assert languages in the view, scroll down to one off screen, then assert the remainder and repeat. Your way is actually very clean and intuitive as scroll until visible is doing the assertions itself. Yeah, I thought that was a, 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 it was a cool way to structure that flow. Um, yeah, I, I initially did it like him and then I noticed that the Android and iOS are different heights and then I went, okay, no, I cannot, I cannot rely on just knowing where to stop. So I just let my S2 do the thing. All right. Last question, I guess, as I'm scrolling down and then we can follow up since we're at the top. Here's uh, Matthew saying, maybe I missed it, but who and when do you create new tests at the end of a feature continuously when iterating on that feature? At the end of the feature, because that's when we are, we are, we know that not, nothing will change, but we also have another mentality is that whenever something breaks, let's say, for example, something does, does go out to production that breaks something. Let's say if I click the send button twice, that actually performs an error. So we make a test that is clicking the send button twice, just isolated, just, just to that thing. So we, we never regress on it. This, I imagine this will pile up at one point and maybe we will need to have a, a separate uh, folder for just this exclusively regression testing that are not the other regression folder that we have. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, uh, we are at time. So. I, I would stay longer, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time here. And what this tells me is we should have more of these. And so in closing, A, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, our community out there, everyone who are supporters of Maestro, seriously, we, we appreciate all the engagement and, and spending the time on this framework and, and taking the time to be here today. A huge, huge, huge thank you, Raul, um, for being here and and sharing your story and and yeah, just taking the time because I know you got a busy day, you have a lot to do. So a, a huge thank you to you, Raul. I'm so glad thank to you be for having me. And uh, and then in closing, as I mentioned, we will make sure to follow up. We'll have a recording of this as well. Uh, stay tuned for that. I will say I do want to do more of these. Feel free to message me if you want to, if you're interested in sharing your story and, and would love to do a session similar to this. Uh, so just let, you know, cause I think it's super powerful to share some best practices of how people are deploying Maestro at their companies and, and what are some of those unique things to y'all that you think others could benefit from. I would love to do these more regularly. And so, so feel free to message me in Slack, just find me Jake or shoot me an email, jake at mobile.dev. And, and yeah, thanks so much everyone for being here. We'll make sure to follow up on the rest of these questions because um, there's a lot of it and we'd love to see it. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, evening, where I feel I've got folks all across the world, which is so cool. And so, yeah, we'll talk and connect with y'all soon. Thanks again. Bye.